also a, a clinical scenario based question very important before we go on i just want to add a line here that when we talk about emphysema on a ct scan we can differentiate emphysema as a centri lobular type and pan lobular type and in smokers which you classically think emphysema is associated with you will have a centri lobular emphysematous changes while in this case where we saw the alpha 1 antitrypsin that would be a pan lobular emphysematous changes that you will read in your pathology also i am sure children now you can put things together and see how dr bharat has brought one clinical situation where you could see radiology and physiology all integrated together dr bharat thank you for a beautiful case all the children in the chat box are enjoying just you know give us another case now yeah another case a 65 year old male chronic smoker is evaluated for progressive dyspnea so he had a progressive dyspnea and with low pitched inspiratory and expiratory wheeze so whenever such a patient walks into my clinic so when he is having wheeze both during inspiration and expiration so i have a doubt whether this fellow is having some strider so strider is very very dangerous because whenever the central airway is occluded so there will be strider if it progress patient can go into respiratory failure so when i have found out his medical history so he told me that this patient was having a necrotizing pancreatitis episode that resulted in ards and once again very important pancreatitis patients can later on progress into ards and ultimate treatment for ards is mechanical ventilation so mechanical ventilation usually we do it through an endotracheal tube so that tube will be put into the trachea and he has been ventilated for a few days for 6 weeks prior to his recovery so the flow volume curve is shown so now this fellow is having some respiratory compromise he is having some strider i have done a spirometry uh, this is a flow volume curve so this is a box shaped flow volume curve showing that uh, both during inspiration and expiration there is severe compromise of the volume so what will be the most likely cause of patient symptoms so i'll explain you here so whenever i see both inspiratory and expiratory compromise in a patient after mechanical ventilation i feel that there is some obstruction happening in his central airway only when the obstruction is there in central airway and it is fixed obstruction not changed during inspiration and expiration you will have such a compromise both during inspiration and expiration so what might have caused such a respiratory compromise in this patient so going option by option so it cannot be an aspirated foreign body because uh, anybody will be aware of foreign body in their trachea so there is no history and copd generally will not have such type of a curve so what happens in copd and what happens in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis so we will discuss in the physiological aspect in a while and putting all this together so patient previously was ventilated now with strider like picture and compromise both during inspiration and expiration all indicates there is some narrowing of his central airway so the best possible answer is subglottic stenosis so here the take home message is whenever a patient who has recovered from a ventilator don't think everything is done so you should also monitor for his uh, symptoms after uh, at least 1 to 2 months because these patients have tendency to develop subglottic stenosis so this is one case where we have seen the fixed airway obstruction so usually happening in the large central airways so now i hand over uh, this to uh, the case to uh, anupama ma'am so to discuss various flow volume curves so what do you see in obstructive lung disease what do you see in restrictive lung disease so what do you see in large central airway obstruction what is this fixed obstruction so variable extra thoracic and intra thoracic madam please take over right thank you and uh, this is again and um uh, uh, this is again a uh, very interesting uh, topic a lot of flow volume loops flow volume curves and let's have a look at it i'm going to start with the basics how do you actually record the uh, a record of flow volume loop now um how we go about doing this is a very simple kind of a maneuver we ask the subject or the patient to take a maximum inspiration once he has taken a maximum inspiration and remember we discussed it previously what is the lung volume at the end of a maximum inspiration his total lung capacity right 
So he's going to start this maneuver from a total lung capacity. And my instructions to the patient are that he has to breathe out. He has to breathe out forcefully and as fast as possible, because what am I going to measure is, is his expiratory flow rate. This has to be done in liters per second. It is, it is per unit time. So time is essential here. So my instructions to the patient are going to be maximum inspiration, Lung volume at maximum inspiration is equal to total lung capacity. From here, he starts to breathe out forcefully and as fast as possible. And we will be measuring his expiratory flow rate. Expiratory flow rate in liters per second. This is, uh, this is being done here. And at the end of this maneuver, at the end when he expires forcefully, his lung volume will be equal to residual volume. Again, something which I've discussed with you, the lung minimum lung volume at the end of a forceful expiration is residual volume. So this is, this is his expiration. This is his flow, uh, flow rate during expiration. And what do we find? During the initial part of his expiration, there is an increase in the flow rate. As he is forcefully expiring, there is an increase in flow rate. And this part of the curve is in fact known as the effort dependent part, effort dependent part of the flow volume curve, effort dependent part of the flow volume curve. Then the, the, he, the flow rate reaches a maximum and this maximum is known as PEFR, peak expiratory flow rate. This is the maximum flow rate that he's able to achieve. Then even though he is using his uh, expiratory muscles, he's, uh, he's applying, he's using, he's applying effort, but the flow rate instead of increasing has now started decreasing, yes? So there is now a decrease that you see in spite of maximum effort being used, the flow rate instead of decree increasing starts falling. And what is the reason for this falling rate, expiratory flow rate? This is because of something known as dynamic compression of airways. There is a tendency of the airways to collapse during a forceful expiration. And if there is a tendency of the airways to collapse, the flow rate will start reducing. So because of this collapse of the airways, there is a decrease in the flow rate. This, in fact, is what is known as the effort independent part. Effort independent part of his flow volume curve. This is the effort independent. It is not related to the effort because what is determining the flow rate is the degree of collapse of the airways. At the end of a forceful expiration, what is going to happen to the airways? The airways are completely collapsed. And when they're completely collapsed, air gets trapped in the alveoli. And the air which is trapped in the alveoli is known as residual volume. This is at the end of a forceful expiration. So this is what is known as an expiratory flow volume curve. Now, when he is at residual volume, I now ask him to take a maximum inspiration from minimum lung volume. I ask him to inflate his lungs maximally. And when he inflates his lung maximally, he now goes from residual volume to total lung capacity. So this is, is the inspiratory flow volume curve. You combine the two curves and you get a loop. So this is your flow volume loop, right? What have we found over here? The As you go from left to right, there is in fact a decrease in lung volume. So if this was six liters, then five, four, three, two, and one. From total lung capacity to rest left to right is a decreasing lung volume. The, uh, you, the uh, uh, expiratory flow volume curve has got an effort dependent part and an effort independent part. Effort independent part is, um, uh, is like I told you, determined by the dynamic compression. It's due to the dynamic compression of airways. Now, another important thing, another important parameter that you can measure over here, what is total lung capacity minus residual volume? Total lung capacity minus residual volume, that is forced vital capacity. So this also gives you an idea about the forced vital capacity. There is yet another parameter which you can see from the flow volume loop, and that is the MEFR, mid-expiratory flow rate. Mid-expiratory flow rate, also known as FEF 25 to 75%, forced expiratory flow rate between 25 to 75% of vital capacity.
So if this is, if the, the width of this loop is equal to the vital capacity, this is 50%, this is 25%, this is 75% of vital capacity. If I see the flow, if I see the rates between 25 and 75 percent of vital capacity, take the average that will give me an idea about MEFR, mid expiratory flow rate, or FEF 25 to 75 percent, the forced expiratory flow rate between 25 to 75 percent of vital capacity. MEFR is a very sensitive indicator of uh, uh, early obstructive lung disease. Let's have a look at, brief look at what are these different, different, what happens in obstructive and restrictive lung diseases. We've already had, uh, you've already had Dr. Bharat telling you about what happens to total lung capacity. Total lung capacity in obstructive lung disease is normal to increased. Vital capacity decreased to normal. Residual volume because of air trapping definitely increases. Remember, in obstructive lung disease, it is an obstruction to flow. So what is affected primarily in obstructive lung disease are the rates, PEFR, MEFR, FEV1 by FEC. These are mainly affected, not so much the volumes. The rates are mainly affected on obstructive in an obstructive lung disease. But what happens in a restrictive lung disease? Restricted, restrictive means restriction in expansion. So what is going to be affected more in restrictive lung disease are the volumes. So total lung capacity is reduced, vital capacity is reduced, residual volume is reduced, but the rates are not much affected. The uh, Another important point that you have to remember in restrictive lung disease is residual volume is reduced except in extraparenchymal. Extraparenchymal lung uh, extraparenchymal, you know, the restrictive lung diseases can be parenchymal and extraparenchymal. Extraparenchymal can be due to neuromuscular problems or due to chest wall deformities. Residual volume in extraparenchymal can be variable. In fact, it can also increase. So let's see. Let's see what will happen to the flow volume curves. Now, this is a normal flow volume loop. Sorry, this is a normal flow volume loop. Now, what happens in obstructive? What happens in restrictive? So whatever we did just now, that little table, incorporating that, you will see this. In an obstructive lung disease, there is an increase in the total lung capacity. There is an increase in the residual volume. The PEFR is reduced, the peak expiratory flow rate is reduced, but what is very important is the shape of the curve. This is known as a scooped out curve, scooped out curve, right? The shape of the curve itself is altered. Let's look at restrictive. Now, restrictive lung disease, remember I told you restriction and expansion. So what is going to happen to total lung capacity? Please keep in mind from left to right is a decreasing lung volume. So here, the restrictive lung disease, the flow volume loop is shifted to the right. Restrictive, R for restrictive, R for right, right shift of the flow volume loop. Why right shift? What has happened to the total lung capacity? Total lung capacity in this case is now reduced. There is a redu reduction in total lung capacity. There is a reduction in the residual volume. But remember, the, the rates are not as much affected as in the case of obstructive. Obstructive, the rates are mainly more affected as compared to the volumes. In restrictive, the volumes are affected uh, more as compared to the rates. Of course, it's a, it's, it is a narrow loop in the case of restrictive. Vital capacity is reduced, so it's a narrow loop. Now, um, one important point here is extraparenchymal. I told you in extraparenchymal, the residual volume may in fact increase. There is an increase in the residual volume. Uh, so what will happen is this is a very typical curve which is seen in extraparenchymal. This is typically described as the curve lies within the normal curve. This is typically seen in extraparenchymal, restrictive extraparenchymal. Let's see these um, uh, uh, typical curves. Obstructive lung disease, a scooped out curve, scooped out curve. In restrictive lung disease, extraparenchymal curve lies within a normal curve because of increase in residual volume. Restrictive lung disease, parenchymal, this is a tall and a narrow curve. 
right? So these are very typically scooped out curve in obstructive lung disease, restrictive lung disease parenchymal, tall and narrow in uh, restrictive lung disease, extra parenchymal curve lies within the normal curve. Let's have a look at what you just saw, a large airway obstruction. Large airway obstruction can be extrathoracic, intrathoracic. How do you define what is the extrathoracic or intrathoracic? If it is above the sixth tracheal ring, that is extrathoracic. Below the sixth tracheal ring is intrathoracic. Right? And large airway obstruction, like I said, can be extrathoracic and intrathoracic. Uh, the these these can be further subdivided into fixed and variable both can be divided into fixed and variable you just had um, you just had dr bharat telling you about a fixed type of large airway obstruction and what is the type of uh, the loop that you are going to get is in both extrathoracic and intrathoracic the loop that you get is this both the inspiratory and the expiratory curves are flattened. It is a box type of loop. This is seen in a fixed large airway obstruction, whether it's extrathoracic or intrathoracic. Let's see what happens in the extrathoracic variable and intrathoracic variable. In extrathoracic variable, the expiratory curve is normal extrathoracic variable, the expiratory curve is normal, the, the inspiratory curve, the inspiratory curve is flattened. Inspiratory curve is flattened. A typical example of an extrathoracic variable would be vocal cord paralysis, right? So this is the um, inspiratory curve is flattened or truncated. This is typically seen in extrathoracic variable. How do I remember this? E for extrathoracic, in extrathoracic variable, E for expiratory, so expiratory curve is normal, inspiratory curve is flattened. In intrathoracic variable, intrathoracic variable obstruction, it could be because of a large goiter which has got uh, intrathoracic extension, inspiratory curve is normal, the expiratory curve is flattened. So these are your uh, different types of flow volume loops in different uh, in different uh, disorders. So just a brief recap, in obstructive lung disease, scooped out curve, in restrictive parenchymal, tall and narrow curve, in restrictive extra parenchymal curve lies within the normal curve, in a large airway obstruction fixed type, it's a box type of curve, both the inspiratory and expiratory curves are flattened, in extrathoracic variable, expiratory curve is normal, inspiratory is flattened, intrathoracic variable, inspiratory curve is uh, normal, expiratory is flattened.